Yeah, for those of you whom, whom I don't already know, I'm Steve Slick, the director of the Intelligence Studies Project here at UT. And on behalf of our colleagues at the Clemens Center for National Security, the Strauss Center for International Security and Law, and the LBJ School of Public Affairs, welcome to today's event on countering terrorism in an era of great power competition. Before I introduce our distinguished guests, I'd like to thank our hosts here at the Harry Ransom Center. The collections and exhibits here are really among the absolute treasures that can be found on campus. And as always, uh, I should note that we're in debt to our program teams. And in this case, that's Kim Nguyen and her colleagues at the Strauss and Clement Center. So thanks a lot. So the, forma the format for today's event is familiar and relatively straightforward, even if the issues we intend to discuss are not. So we've asked our guest speaker for, to spend a few minutes speaking on the assigned topic, or frankly, any other matter that may be on her mind. Uh, then she's agreed to participate in a moderated discussion with our colleague Paul Pope, who many of you know has a wealth of experience in counterterrorism, including uh, service as the deputy director in CIA's counterterrorism center. So Paul will reserve time at the end of the session for your questions before we close. And on the way out, I want to remind you to help yourself to a cookie from Austin's own Tiff's Treats. So I'll also shamelessly steal another 30 seconds of your time to steer you towards several upcoming events you may find interesting. So next Monday, April 10th, Bob Cadillac, former Assistant Secretary of Health and Human Services for Preparedness, will brief us on the Senate's 20-month investigation into the origins of the COVID-19 virus. And the Connections Conference, focusing on global media, diplomacy, and foreign policy, will take place on the 10th and 11th here on campus at that Bass Lecture Hall. And a variety of Strauss, Clements, and ISP experts, including our exciting new Global Disinformation Lab, will be featured at this conference. So look that up. And finally, a week from today at the LBJ School, we'll be hosting Beth Sanner for a discussion of intelligence support to senior policymakers. Beth, in addition to being a career trainee classmate of mine and friend for 30 years, was most recently the Deputy Director of National Intelligence for Mission, Manage Mission Integration, excuse me, and was also coincidentally responsible for the President's daily briefing. So please check our websites for details on these and other upcoming events. So, to the topic at hand. In August 2004, almost three years after Al-Qaeda's successful attacks on the World Trade Center in New York, and the Pentagon in Northern Virginia, President Bush signed an executive order creating the National Counterterrorism Center. Later that fall, the NCTC was established in law and embedded in the new Office of the Director of National Intelligence. Building on the existing Terrorist Threat Integration Center, NCTC was charged with integrating and analyzing all the intelligence available to the government on terrorism. In short, detecting and helping disrupt further catastrophic attacks on the homeland. And we're honored this afternoon to host Christy Abizade, the eighth director of the NCTC and the first woman to lead America's counterterrorism enterprise. Christy has a wealth of national security experience. For example, during the Obama administration, she served as the deputy assistant secretary of defense for Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Central Asia. Before that, she served on the National Security Council staff as a director for counterterrorism and a senior policy advisor to the assistant to the president for homeland security and counterterrorism. Her boss in that job, you'll recognize, was ISP's advisor and fellow Longhorn John Brennan, who'll be on campus later this week. Christie began her intelligence career as an analyst with the Defense Intelligence Agency's Joint Intelligence Task Force. During this period, she deployed several times to the Middle East, including a tour as the senior DIA counterterrorism representative in Iraq. Before returning to government service to lead the NCTC, Christie was a proud resident of Austin and a regular participant in our programs while she was working as an executive at Dell Technologies. Christie earned her bachelor's degree from the University of California, San Diego, go Tritons, and a master's in international policy studies from Stanford. So we're friends, former colleagues, and I'm really proud to welcome Director Abizade back to the 40 Acres. So if you want to How walk do you around. do this, yeah? yeah? Okay. Hi, everybody. Thanks for being here. Um, so Paul and I talked. We thought maybe I would wander aimlessly on stage for a couple minutes 
uh, and give you a lay down of the global threat environment as we see it from the National Counterterrorism Center. Just to start the conversation and then uh, really looking forward to the questions that he has, but more importantly, any questions that, that you all want to raise. Um, you know, as, as Steve introduced, you know, I lead the National Counterterrorism Center and our job is to be the knowledge manager for the United States government on the global and international terrorism landscape. And so um, we spend a lot of time thinking about how we communicate this effectively to senior policymakers. We also think about how we communicate this effectively to um, first responders, to um, the healthcare community, to uh, any element of American society that could have to deal with the aftermath or be part of the prevention of a terrorist attack, particularly on US soil, but against Americans overseas everywhere. And so um, in an era where counterterrorism is not the number one thing that we talk about from a national security perspective anymore, um, which is something we're very proud about actually, uh, I thought it'd be useful to spend a little bit of time spinning out how we do see the threat today, uh, how it's evolved over time, and then, um, and then have any kind of conversation you want to have after that. So um, we describe the threat today to the United States homeland at its lowest point uh, at any time since 9-11. We've described it that way for two years in a row. This makes probably the third time that we've said that publicly, and, and that is a, a really important testament to the counterterrorism community that um, we built after 9-11, and that has dealt with particular aspects of the counterterrorism challenge, uh, especially Sunni violent uh, jihadist organizations like Al Qaeda, like ISIS, the various branches of ISIS, that has really done an incredible job of suppressing that threat. Um, that has created a manifestation of the threat today, whether in the United States or in other parts of the West, that actually looks more like lone actor terrorism than the highly networked, highly hierarchical threat that Al Qaeda, that Bin Laden, that um, Zarqawi, that ISIS presented for so many years in the aftermath of 9-11. And this lone actor threat is very difficult to, to get ahead of. It's hard to be proactive and understand individual mindsets that um, might lead someone to mobilize to violence. And the fact that Today's threat, the most lethal version of it, is presented by lone actors, often with less sophistication than we saw on 9-11, than we saw in some of the attacks after 9-11. Um, that's a real credit to the suppressive effect that we have had as a United States government, as an international community, against that networked threat. But I want to be really clear, that networked threat is still something we're dealing with every day in today's environment. Um, you know, I, I get a morning brief. Um, it is uh, about terrorism challenges, terrorism reporting all over the world. And um, every day, we're dealing with some aspect of the challenge as it presents itself in today's manifestation. Uh, if I think about the threat warnings that have been public over the last six months, right? Um, maybe longer. There's a threat warning in South Africa to make sure civilians um, protect themselves in the event of terrorist planning. There's threat warning in Kenya. There's a disruption in Strasbourg. There um, are, there's a, a new US military footprint that is persistent in Somalia about the threat that Al-Shabaab poses. There are constant attacks in Mali. There's the spread of ISIS networks into new territories that we haven't dealt with in the counterterrorism world in parts of Africa. There, um, there are threats posed by elements operating out of Afghanistan. The networked threat, the traditional Al Qaeda, the traditional ISIS threat uh, remains a problem, remains highly capable and requires an effective and sustainable counterterrorism enterprise to continue to combat. And, um, we are very fortunate that we don't have to talk about that every day. 
because if we're talking about it every day, it means that something else has slipped through the cracks, and um, and 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 we've got even more work to do. So, as a counterterrorism professional who has worked uh, some aspect of the terrorism challenge since 2002, since the summer of 2002, to see where we were uh, in those days and where we've come in terms of the counterterrorism counterterrorism enterprise built to deal with the persistent threat, I'm just really proud about um, the fact that we have not had another attack on US soil at the scale of 9-11 in, in the years since. When we talk about the threat environment, we don't only talk about the lone actor threat, we don't only talk about the important networked threat that Al Qaeda and that ISIS present, but we talk about sort of the diversity of today's threat environment relative to prior years and we talk about the diffusion of that threat environment. So I wanna break those down a little bit for you so you understand what we mean when we say that. So first of all, on the diversity of the threat, one, I said the most likely lethal attacks are gonna happen from lone actors. Those lone actors are gonna be motivated by a range of ideologies. We've talked a lot already about ISIS and Al-Qaeda, but there are um, racially and ethnically motivated violent extremists that operate transnationally and globally. There are anti-government, anti-authority, violent extremists. Um, there are Iranian state agents and Iranian Shia proxies that operate in the Middle East, that operate here in the United States homeland, seeking revenge for the assassination of Soleimani, uh, seeking to silence uh, critics of the Iranian regime. Um, We've got uh, organizations that call themselves ISIS, but used to be Boko Haram, right? We have um, uh, the spread of terrorism in parts of the world that is really an exploitation of these underlying conditions that make situations ripe for terrorists. So um, a combination of transnational organized crime governance challenges, corruption, climate change, all leading to an environment that uh, terrorist groups can exploit and spread and um, recruit individuals to their cause, maybe not on the basis of ideology, but on the basis of needing to feed their family. And so uh, these areas of global instability, these areas of fragility that create operating space for terrorist groups to thrive is a major challenge for us to understand in the National Counterterrorism Center. Uh, when I think about the early part of my career and where the center of gravity for the counterterrorism fight was, it was squarely in the Middle East and, and, and in South Asia. Today's fight is spread to parts of Africa. It spans all the way from West Africa to Southeast Asia. And so, when we talk about the diffusion of the threat, we're not dealing with a centrally led organization operating from the hinterlands of the AFPAC theater that is trying to find new and novel ways to conduct attacks, but that is highly networked, um, that is responsive to singular leadership direction. We're talking about sort of an atomization of the threat across territory that as an intelligence leader is a lot of the world to cover down on. Al-Qaeda does not just exist in the AFPAC theater. In fact, it basically doesn't exist in the AFPAC theater anymore. It exists in Yemen with the Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. It exists in Somalia with Al-Shabaab. It exists in Mali and in West Africa with JNIM and Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb. <coughs> it, um, it is still present in parts of Syria, and um, the interconnectivity between these nodes of uh, Al-Qaeda affiliates is a major transnational problem for us to understand and get ahead of. ISIS has that same sort of expansion of its brand, even as in Iraq and Syria, they are probably at their lowest level of capability we've seen since 2014 and their rise and return um, to, to Iraq and Syria 
and, and the dominant presence that they, uh, and dominant threat that they, they presented in parts of Europe and parts of the United States. And as we look at sort of this diffuse ground that our terrorist adversaries are covering, and we think about what that requires of us as a counterterrorism community, at a time when counterterrorism isn't the point of our national security strategy, this is a really important time of transformation that as a, counter, as a leader in the counterterrorism enterprise, as a leader in the intelligence community, we're trying to take care of. And so I'll end on this note of transition. I know we'll talk about counterterrorism in the era of great power competition. But what's important is that we sustain the capability to continue to suppress the threat. We sustain the capability to understand how that threat is evolving. And we stay steps ahead of that evolution so we can continue to protect Americans and not allow the counterterrorism challenge to once again dominate our national security agenda. We've seen too many times, whether it's the attacks on 9-11, whether it's the fall of Mosul, uh, too many times that the counterterrorism <coughs> challenge swings us right back into a reactive foreign policy agenda that doesn't allow us to focus on great power competition, that doesn't allow us to rightly array resources against our near peer competitor in China or uh, Putin's war of aggression in Ukraine. And so as, uh, as, as we look across the counterterrorism landscape, understand how the challenge will continue to pose risk to the United States, we've got to be really smart as a whole of government leadership team about preserving the capability to deal with that threat and, and ensuring that the strategic dis surprise, this dis the strategic distraction that can result from this terrible brand of political violence doesn't dominate our national security prioritization scheme again. So with that, why don't I stop there and thank we you. can have a conversation. So thank you. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Paul Pope. I'm a professor at the OBJ School and a fellow of the Clements and Strauss Centers. And I do want to go to a question about this, um, this topic of terrorism in this era of strategic competition, but I wanted to start, if it's okay with you, by summarize something I just recently read, okay, and it, it was, um, to give me a second to do this. The NSC's meeting on CT was tense. Some members believe we should prioritize our focus and, and our strategy vis-a-vis -vis large state actor rivals, and that strategy was already beginning to bear fruit, and that a continued diversion of tension to terrorism was not in our interest. Some of those arguing for making terrorism a priority argued that our state actor rivals were exploiting terrorism for their own purposes and that decreased access and stability in certain regions of the world hurt the United States and the West geopolitically more than hurt those rivals. There were other debates having to do with law enforcement, military options, covert action tools, as well as how much collection and analytic attention we should put on the CT objective. <clears throat> and when I say this is recent, it's recent because I'm talking about the, an NSC meeting in 1984 and I read it in Dr. Will Inbone's book, The Peacemaker, this morning. So I, I make this, this point, I literally just happened to read it this morning, um, and, I, and I thought I was gonna include it because I already used this phrase once for you today, but this isn't our first rodeo. In many ways, the post 9-11 period that many of us, that many of the younger folks in particular grew up in mm -hmm. was the anomaly, and we've actually returned to a management of terrorism within the context of our broader foreign policy and strategic objectives. But I would like to ask you to speak to how do we how do we get the right level? How do we keep our eye on the ball while having these other priorities? Yeah. Uh, so um, I love that. I love that um, quote from Will's book. I'm going to have to assign it as required reading for the national counterterrorism that are going forward. Uh, you're welcome, Will. There you go. <laughs> it's good to see you. Um, so, um, so, so I, I, I think this is the most important challenge for us in the counterterrorism community to manage successfully through. And the only way you do that is by proactively engaging in, one, understanding the resources that you have dedicated to any problem being really transparent about where capability gaps are emerging because of a shift in collection resources or a change in advers the adversary's behavior that challenge your past ways of doing business. 
You know, it, it, we talk a lot about the success of our counterterrorism community as a success that's been built on collaboration, transparency, and interdependencies. Now, um, when you are in an era of declining resources and a necessary reprioritization away from the counterterrorism fight, one agency's <coughs> decision in a enterprise that is so highly interdependent can have knock-on second and third mm -hmm. order effects that um, will debilitate us in a way that we didn't anticipate when saying, you know, these collection resources should go in this direction and all of a sudden <coughs> something on border security doesn't work the way it used to. And unless you were transparent and obvious about how that thread was pulled, you wouldn't know what risk you were creating. And so um, for, for the role that we have in the National Counterterrorism Center to sort of look at the strategic landscape, not just of what the intelligence community is collecting, but how US government resources are arrayed against the counterterrorism challenge, it's really important for us to create a managed process of resource allocation to the CT threat. And, um, and we're doing this, I think, in a way and in an era when because you are dealing with scarcity, um, you are actually sort of filling a need that in a time when we were doing counterterrorism immediately post 9-11 and it was all resources that you need, no questions asked, right. you never really had to do. Right. And so we're actually creating new systems of process management, governance of uh, across US government resources that, that today are critical to threat management going forward. And you've already experienced some cuts, and I heard earlier today you were saying that you didn't think that because of these things we've learned and, and yeah. maybe efficiencies, you don't feel like we've it's affected the mission much. Yeah. Is that what you're saying so far? So far, yeah. I mean, I, uh, yeah, the counterterrorism community over the last, I would call it, let's call it five years, has has seen cuts in its its mission. And I mean, some of those come from very reasonable places. We do not have a large footprint in Afghanistan today. Um, and that Afghanistan footprint was really considered a critical and core CT mission. Those and resources are expensive. gone. It's very expensive. Um, and so, you know, you look at that and you say, okay, well, we've repositioned away. What do we need to do to make up for the challenge of not being there physically? But that's a that's a cost that you can bear, and um, and it's you know once confronted, um, you know a, a manageable challenge. And so. As we look across the places where you've seen resources shift away, or again, some of this is not about resources, but a change in the adversary, where we've seen changes in adversarial behavior that, that make our, our past way of operating no longer relevant. Um, I look across that on at least a semi-annual basis, and we ask ourselves, how healthy are we as a counterterrorism enterprise? And we are still pretty healthy. Now, I would tell you I am constantly asking the question of when have we cut too deep, how do we know before we do it, and what do we do to engage with our congressional overseers, what do we do to engage with the, the policy community, uh, with OMB to make sure that we have what we need to, to, to continue to suppress the threat, and that is an ongoing conversation and I think an important responsibility that we have as the counterterrorism community does nothing but counterterrorism, to facilitate the rest of the intelligence community, the rest of the national security structure to go do other things. Yeah, you know, I wanted to come back to something you emphasized a minute ago and ask you to kind of uh, pull it out a little bit more for our audience. You were emphasizing the interagency collaboration, coordination. Uh, it's an enterprise that works on this. Tell us how, how that's managed. How do you work with the other actors in that, in that area? Um, and, and how important is it? Um, uh, blood, sweat, and tears, that's how yeah. it's managed. Yeah. <laughs> Painful bureaucratic knife fights, uh, but also, you know, it's, it's interesting. When you, when you take um, the, counter the, the elements responsible for counterterrorism out of their agency context and bring them into a room, with all of their colleagues that are also responsible for counterterrorism outcomes, whether operational intelligence or policy, um, that sort of ability to convene, that meeting of the minds for the counterterrorism enterprise 
to make decisions about what, where you need to focus your energy, to make decisions about what collection gaps you need to fill, to have the same site picture on what the threat looks like today so you can posture for it tomorrow. Um, you know, that, that is, that is the, 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 just the work and the, the kind of collaboration that has to happen. Uh, first of all, with the counter the, the, the agencies responsible for counterterrorism, but then lifting that out of just the counterterrorism context. So, you know, the deputy director of CIA can see about, see how the counterterrorism threat needs to be balanced against all of these priorities he's dealing with, with uh, emerging technologies or the competition with China, and make sure that, you know, he's balancing appropriately. And in a time of great power competition where we know where we need to make up ground in terms of the amount of investment that we've had as a United States government, it is tempting to look at this counterterrorism bucket and say, well, let's just pull from there and move it to these other challenges. And what we've got to be really clear about is the describing the persistence of the counterterrorism threat, being you know, precise about what capability we need to deal with that threat, and then having a trade-off conversation of, well, if you take it from here, understand very clearly what risk we incur, and maybe that's the right decision, but let's at least surface that conversation to make sure that we're allocating resources effectively for, for whatever the kind of threat is we're trying to deal with. Yeah, and I, I think the, um, your, your comment earlier about knock-on effects, I think when you, when you begin to integrate you start with sort of cooperation and then, you know, maybe coordination and you move towards integration. Eventually, if you keep going, you, you end up at mutual dependence. And so then when people began to, I remember when I was deputy director of counterterrorism center, asking my boss if he knew how many NGA people we had there, and it was hundreds. So if NGA decided to decrease Absolutely. that mission, we would be, uh, so it's a very important um, aspect of it. I don't, I don't want to say, sorry, I'm sorry, sorry can, I, can I just yeah, say no, one other absolutely. thing? So we're talking a lot about sort of resource management. I know it's very exciting for all of you. But, um, but there's another aspect of thinking about great power competition and counterterrorism that's not about like the counterterrorism enterprise needing to protect against the threat, but it's actually about the usefulness of our counterterrorism capability for those countries that are also dealing with uh, encroachment from our, our, our other competitors and adversaries. So, you know, I, I've spent some time, though I, I want to spend more, um, on the continent of Africa in key CT hotspots. Um, those are really important counterterrorism priorities for us to manage. But they also sort of squarely intersect with priority on, you know, China's investment in different, um, yeah. in different countries and understanding Wagner and yeah, the where Russia's Wagner have. is, you know, really gaining ground in parts of Africa. And so, you know, the relationship we have with some of these countries is built on a common interest of counterterrorism, but it's highly relevant and very useful in the context of great power competition and how that relationship really pays dividends and in a very tangible way on their number one concern, which often is still counterterrorism, but that should be sort of leveraged and engaged on in, in an era of all sort of national security threats we're trying to protect. Yeah, and, and our, our counterterrorism capabilities are kind of, nobody else has that. And, and I've found even countries that were not happy with this, we're quite happy to take threat information That's and right. help us or help us help them. And that, that actually segues into the next question I was going to have, which is, the national security strategy said that we're shifting from a U.S.-led and partner-enabled strategy to a partner-led and U.S.-enabled strategy. Mm -hmm. What does that actually mean in practical terms? It's a good turn of the phrase, but yeah. what does it mean? Um, I mean, I, I think in one way it means that you have less boots on the ground in, in some of these terrorism hotspots, right? We don't have a, a, a presence in Afghanistan, right? We have. Uh, a managed and smaller footprint in Somalia than we've had in years past. But it also means that in West Africa, where we're kind of building from scratch, we've got to be thoughtful not about what direct U.S. capability needs to be deployed to the region, but what relationships we need to build, what capacity we need to enable of our partners in the area 
or are other foreign partners with capability in the area so we've got a collective responsibility to deal with the CT threat? And that, and that really is an interesting question to me is the, uh, we're talking about coordination on say threats, but you also have this capacity building, you know, and it could be, as, it could be something specific like better border control, yep. record keeping or something like that. So that is a, a, an effort that a number of different agencies of the U.S. would be involved in that. Is that something that's specially managed in terms of like a working group or something to prioritize and talk about which agencies are going to take the lead with various countries or various agencies in yeah. countries and that kind of thing? Yeah, I mean, a lot of this gets managed by a very capable National Security Council process where you have a CT directorate and um, the Homeland Security Advisor who also has responsibility for counterterrorism really kind of pressure test whether the the strategic goals we have in a particular region are going to be met by the level of investment that we as a United States government have in that in those areas and and where there might be a say do gap what do we do to make up for that in terms of renewed investment higher level engagement you know lots of different policy tools now from an intelligence perspective our job is to really accurately assess not just what the threat environment looks like, but what kind of partner capacity exists in the areas where we think it's most urgent. And where our partners are not yet capable, what long-term investment do we need to make? Um, and where we don't have partners at all, what unilateral capability do we need to be able to bring to bear um, when the situation would require it? <clears throat> so, um, switching gears a little bit, in, in the absence of any kind of uh, positive action by Congress, Section 702 of the FISA Act uh, is set to expire at the end of the year, if I have that right. And how important is it that Congress reauthorize this tool, in your opinion? It is critically important. Um, you know, I can, I can speak about it from the counterterrorism perspective. In fact, it's a, it's a tool that was granted because of the counterterrorism agility that we needed um, as a United States government against what I have already described is still a persistent threat to us. It's, it's also hugely relevant in the non-counterterrorism context. As we have sort of been able to, to leverage the tool, we've seen its usefulness uh, in counterintelligence investigations. We've seen its, use, its usefulness uh, in cyber, in the cyber realm. We've seen its usefulness against China and, and other other state actors that are of major concern, and so, you know, um, and then when I think about it from a counterterrorism perspective, I think about the information that we derive from 702 as underpinning almost everything we do in the counterterrorism realm, whether that's high-value targeting operations like the operation that killed Ayman al Zawahiri, the leader of Al Qaeda in downtown Kabul whether that's border security operations, whether that's understanding known and suspected terrorists who may be seeking to enter the United States, whether that's law enforcement disruptions and the kind of intelligence and liaison sharing partnerships that we have to have. You know, the, the success of the United States um, communications industry has meant that we have a lot of bad actors traversing what the United States has built for the globe. And 702 allows us to, to target foreign adversaries. With the warrant, right? Well, I mean, yeah. with the, 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 not the adversaries, I'm sorry, but the, I just want to make sure that the, everybody in the audience knows yeah, what it, we're talking about with 702. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's, not, it's not warrantless surveillance, right, right. if that's what, yeah, if that's that's what, what you're getting, referring yeah. to. Yeah. Um, and, and, um, and, and it is, these are, these are foreign targets. Um, in my context, they are foreign terrorist targets that we need to be able to very quickly understand the context of their operating environment and, and determine how we can counter their plans against us. And so, um, you know, it, it, it really is fundamental to everything we do in the counterterrorism world. And in an era of declining resources, in an era where we have fewer uh, overseas boots on the ground, Having this tool in our toolkit to be able to continue to understand what's happening in that threat environment is just critically important. <clears throat> so another important issue, I think, is um, domestic terrorism. And we've already talked about this a little bit today, but uh, I think the audience would be very interested in 
kind of where NCTC is now in the increase. There was a, there was a national security strategy released mm -hmm. focused on domestic terrorism uh, in the summer of 2021, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, That's right. And so uh, where, where do you guys fit into that? Uh, well, so first of all, for that, um, that intelligence assessment, na the National Counterterrorism Center worked across its uh, intelligence community counterparts, principally the FBI and DHS, to kind of bring the intelligence community view to the policy customer about what we as a country were dealing with. On so you produced violation. the intel that supported that strategy? We produced, we, we co-authored the analysis okay. that, that was then the underpinning of the, gotcha. uh, the White House strategy to counter domestic violent extremism. And, um, you know, as we look at sort of the diverse and diffuse landscape and we see the ways in which Americans are most likely to be attacked, we see an increasing lethality of racially and ethically motivated violent extremists against American citizens here in the United States homeland. And so as, you know, the, the lead counterterrorism agency for the United States government, we have to understand that. Now, um, we understand that in collaboration with and in support of the lead homeland agencies, the FBI and DHS. And our role as the National Counterterrorism Center is what our role has always been, which is to focus on the foreign nexus, the transnational dynamics of that threat. And so as we look at collectives like the Terrorgram Collective, which uh, is an online collective of elements that exist, yes, in the United States, but also in multiple countries overseas who talk about mobilization to violence and furtherance of racially and ethnically motivated violent extremism, that's a really important dynamic in today's landscape that not only affects us here in the United States homeland, but affects, um, affects our partners in Brazil. We've seen it in Australia, Germany, UK, the Nordic countries. And it's really important that we have a, a, a dialogue and learn from our foreign counterparts, even as we in the United States are trying to deal with this um, and, and the challenges it presents. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I'd like to shift gears completely if I could. When I, when I was, uh, senior at the, at the agency, I ran across a phenomenon quite often where a young person would come to me and say something, and now I've had students that graduated from here who kind of reported back the same thing, and that is this, that they, they studied international affairs or international regional, or regional studies or something. They wanted to work in the intelligence community. They got a job in the intelligence community. They became a collector, an analyst or something. They succeeded, and then they found themselves as managers and leaders and they hadn't really thought about that. You lead a large organization. Um, you came up doing analysis and things like that. And a lot of my students are, certainly have the potential to be doing great things someday. Yeah. How should they think about preparation for leadership and, and, and while they're still tending to whatever job they've been assigned? Yeah, uh, it's, it's a great question. Um, you know, leaders, are everywhere in the intelligence community, and they are they exist at every grade and in every position. And one of the things that I really encourage is making sure that I don't care how new you are to the National Counterterrorism Center, I don't care whether you've been there forever but have chosen not to have a managerial responsibility, I don't care if you're actually a manager or a leader in our organization, you have a leadership responsibility um, just by dint of the fact that you are there um, and you are charged with the counterterrorism mission on behalf of the United States government. And so fundamentally coming into the job with a mindset of agency and leadership from whatever role you are playing, I think is essential. And then, um, and then being kind of constant and continuous learners as you progress in your career. I learned a great deal from mentors, formal and informal, I learned a heck of a lot from the managers I hated working for, right? Like always sort of understanding what good leadership looks like, um, how to inspire your people, um, especially when things are hard and it feels like there's no way out. Uh, you know, everyone has an opportunity to lead from where they are. And so, um, you know, come in with a mindset of where you can serve what that service looks like in the context of your particular role, what you can learn from good, bad, and ugly leaders that you're surrounded by, 
and what that means for the formal or informal leadership role you want to take on as your career progresses. I, I started as an analyst at the Defense Intelligence Agency and was fully committed to never, ever, 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 ever managing people <laughs> across my career. Um, and, uh, and that all changed when you know, I saw the effect of real leadership and I wanted to be a part of what made a team better. Um, and, um, you know, despite what I thought I wanted to do, things change along the way if you just keep an open mind. That's a great answer. I, I love it. I'm, I actually jotted some notes down. It's very consistent with what I tell students that you... Well, so you, that's why it's a great answer. It is, exactly. <laughs> that's, that's why I agree with you, so it's good. <laughs> but I, I, um, I try to tell them that you're, you're a leader from day one. It's not when you get appointed into some right. title. That's right. Um, and uh, and you, can, you, you also represent... Um, Diversity as a new person, maybe the only thing you can do from a leadership perspective is, is, is kind of question, well, why do we think that? Or, you know, oh, <laughs> whatever yeah. as an analyst. Um, I remember one young man, I'll just say this very quickly, who, who you know, I think you'll appreciate it, who called me and asked me this very question. Hmm. And he is in charge of Ukrainian analysis in Jack Molesworth now. Wow. Um, and he graduated from here after I arrived. Oh, so great. Um, it's, it's, it's great. Um, and, and I mentioned the word diversity in terms of diversity of thought. Mm -hmm. um, how important is diversity in, in the workplace in, in terms of thinking about the terrorism problem and being the kind of organizations that we need to be? Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we had this conversation with your class just a little bit earlier, and, um, and I'll say what I said to them, which is I, I, diversity has to be baked into your uh, theory of organizational effectiveness. Um, and if you think about the comparative advantage we have as a country, the diversity that we have among our citizenry, the melting pot that is the United States, that is hugely beneficial to our ability to compete globally. It is hugely beneficial to um, the kind of innovation that is generated out of this country. And in the intelligence community or in any organization that you lead, if you're not valuing that, if you're not building a structure that, um, that empowers kind of diverse perspectives to emerge in any kind of analytic debate or in any kind of problem solving or um, innovation challenge, then, then you're not creating an effective organization. And there's a lot of really good academic leadership or, or literature that, that talks about how effective organizations, multinational companies, um, you know, uh, nonprofits, what have you, are more effective the more diverse they are, and the more they encourage the diversity of views to be surfaced and to allow employees to bring their whole selves to a job that um, can be grueling if, you're, if you, you don't feel like you can do that. Yeah. So I think it's critically important. I think it's a comparative advantage and a national security advantage for us as a country and as a leader in the intelligence community. I want, I, I want to bring in as much uh, diversity of talent, experience, perspective as I can, and I want to surface that to get after the challenge. Great. Well, with that, I think we're going to turn to questions. I can barely see you guys because of the lights. So I think we have a microphone, don't we? And uh, I'm going to give priority to students. If I can see them, I'm, I'll do that. But um, So there's one right there. Hello, thank you so much for being here. I'm a first year MGPS student, Masters of Global Policy, and dual degree with Middle Eastern Studies. Cool. Uh, so I've been tracking the Wagner Group from Russia hmm. for a long time, and I know that they have a big foothold in Mali. So could you s explain more some of the threats that that's posing in Mali, mm -hmm. and maybe some of the tools that NCTC is looking at to impose in Mali as that is a new area that the United States hasn't really worked in a lot? Yeah, no, thanks for the question. So, um, so, so the, the threat and the opportunity that um, JNIM and the Al-Qaeda affiliate there that um, has to grow in a Mali that has, you know, a very challenged government and a, a, a wide swath of territory that uh, terrorist groups are going to exploit uh, to continue to pursue their growth, their territorial expansion, and you know, concerning for me is what a uh, 
stable and secure environment for JNIM means about their time and space to plan and organize transnational attacks. Um, and so as, as we look at the dynamic that they're exploiting, part of that dynamic is made worse by Wagner's presence in Mali. Um, it's made worse by their human rights abuses. It's made worse by um, the uh, bill of goods they've sold the local government on the effectiveness they can have, and then their, their actual work to exploit natural resources and other things that, um, that, that are critical and, and kind of cash cows for them uh, across the continent. And so um, they are a destabilizing actor in a very unstable part of the world that just increases the challenge that we all are going to have to deal with when trying to understand how the threat will evolve and, and the ways in which that threat will become increasingly problematic, not just for those US and Western interests in the region, but again, transnationally. And so, um, so, so thank you for your work on, on the Wagner Group. I think they're a really problematic actor in the region. They're problematic in lots of different parts. But as we think about the counterterrorism landscape, they are certainly an element of it that is complicating our ability to stay ahead of the threat. Can I ask a couple of just real quick follow-ups on that? One, another thing that's happened is it's, in, in one country at least, it's caused our French allies to, to pull out largely. Are they a Praetorian guard for those regimes? And is there a, how much of a resource nexus do you think there is a Russian interest? This goes to yeah. the strategic competition piece where I'm, mm -hmm. yeah. I'm getting access to resources by helping you against ter with terrorism yeah. problem. Uh, by ostensibly helping you with your yeah, terrorism right, right. problem, right? Uh, yeah, no, I, I think that's exactly right, right? Um, and, you know, how, um, how much they sort of uh, leverage corruptible influences and, and the degree to which they um, get buy-in for a theory of their involvement that actually never pans out in the execution of their mission. When you see the kind of resource grab that, that, um, that they actually go for, the, the places in which they array their forces uh, as not exactly coincident with where the terrorist threat is, uh, those are all dynamics that are, are pretty clear in um, sort of the, the cynical approach that they have to exploiting some of these very fragile, uh, fragile governments. Great, thank you. So, right here, Nicholas. Thank you very much, Director, for coming and speaking with us today. My name is Nicholas. I'm a first year Master's of Global Policy student here. During your introduction, you referenced the threat to the United States of a response in regards to the Soleimani strike, a uh, responding terror terrorism acts incident in the US. I was interested to learn more about how NCTC was aiding in the decision to strike Soleimani, but more so interested in after that decision was made, how NCTC prepares its response or uh, an analysis in regards sure. to this increasing threat. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll talk about it in terms of the analytic challenge that we have, especially in the wake of the, the strike. I, I, um, I, I don't really have an answer for you on, on the, the, the role we did or didn't play in the run-up. It wasn't something that I was there for and, and I haven't inquired about, to be honest. Um, but I will tell you that um, any counterterrorism analyst who's followed Iran or, or followed or the Iranian threat network and the Shia proxies, Lebanese Hezbollah or otherwise, you know, as somebody that um, was sitting on my couch when I learned of, of Soleimani's death, it was very clear to me that we would be entering into a period of retaliation and retribution that would, um, would, would persist for a very long time. And I think, uh, I think that's exactly the challenge that we're dealing with from a counterterrorism perspective. So we, uh, we at the National Counterterrorism Center deal with the Iranian threat actor and their proxy network as a counterterrorism challenge, even as so much of their calculation is wrapped up in things that have nothing to do with, with counterterrorism. Um, and what I see from, from my seat at the, at the head of the National Counterterrorism Center and from my perspective early in my analytic career as somebody that followed Iran and Hezbollah is that we're dealing with a much more brazen Iranian threat, including here inside the United States homeland, than we have dealt with uh, maybe ever. 
Now, we've seen for years the Iranians willing to conduct attacks against dissidents and to pursue them pretty doggedly over a period of decades. That exact same sort of uh, retributive mindset that is that presents a, a, a real and long-term challenge, I think, is true for a belief that they need to retaliate for Soleimani's death. And we saw it in the charges that dropped against uh, an individual associated with the IRGC in seeking the assassination of John Bolton, <coughs> former US government official, who it deemed as somehow connected to the strike against Soleimani. Um, and, and we see it in a number of other cases. But we see that sort of uptick in the threat to the, inside the United States homeland from Iran as a state actor manifests in other ways that, um, you know, whether it's uh, uh, attempted attacks in Turkey against Israeli civilians, whether it's activity in Greece, in Cyprus, in Azerbaijan, that show that they're willing to use terrorism as a tool of statecraft um, in a way that, uh, that I think they had been deterred from for many years. And uh, I think we find ourselves in a period of escalatory violence that um, is manifesting in multiple places, including in the Middle East, including against United States forces that are stationed in Syria, um, but also in, in parts of the world that are not conflict zones, but that we are, we are concerned about Iran's reach and Iran's willingness to use that reach to make a, a, a point of political violence and terrorism. And so, um, so there's, a, there's a lot happening, I think, when you think about not just retaliation for Soleimani, but an Iranian threat actor community that, um, that has influence in large swaths of territory and um, is willing to operate in, in environments that, um, that I think express a, a brazenness and a level of aggression that I'm, I'm pretty uh, surprised to see. Could I, I'm, I'm going to follow up on that one as well, if I may. <clears throat> we often referred in the past to Hezbollah as a proxy of the Iranians, and uh, they still obviously have a close relationship. But do they, um, is their kind of position in Lebanon such now that they're slightly more conservative in their yeah. use of terrorism and, I mean, not quite as responsive to Iranian? What, what? Yeah, I mean, the, the Burgas bombing in, in um in Bulgaria would tell you no. Um, but this was the, the, the favorite debate of us as Hezbollah analysts when I was when I was a young analyst, which is, you know, especially as you saw Hezbollah actually win in elections, right. would this moderate its willingness to use violence and, and terrorism and be responsive to an Iranian um, Iranian kind of patronage when they were asked to perform acts of terrorism on Iran's behalf. And, and, you know, I think that if you look across the Iranian proxy network, they have diversified away from Hezbollah, so they're not entirely reliant on them as a competent and effective action arm. And yet, uh, Hezbollah is the first among, uh, among all of the proxies in terms of the sophistication of the actor. Their own calculus for what's in Lebanon's interest or their perception of Lebanon's interest, what's in Lebanese Hezbollah's interest and how they would evaluate, evaluate that against any request that the Iranian government might, have, government might have of them. And so I am very concerned about uh, Lebanese Hezbollah capability. I think about um, the early days of the Iraq war and the explosively formed penetrators we saw all over the battlefield that were directly related to a Hezbollah transfer of capability to Iraqi Shia militants at the Iran's behest. And it, it's exactly that kind of amplifying impact of a highly trained, very effective, globally present organization that um, that Iran still has a very deep relationship with and that we should be concerned about in terms of the capability that it affords them. Thank you. That's a great answer. Right here, young man. Wait for a microphone. Down here. I want others to hear you. We're recording it. <clears throat> Hi, uh, I'm Jamie. I'm an undergrad. Uh, I wanted to ask how much credit you gave to the idea of stochastic terrorism. That, like, you know, if there's public prejudice against a group, it makes it more likely that random acts of terrorism are going to occur. Oh, that's interesting. Um, meaning that the more pressure there is on a terrorist group, the more likely you you are to see them conduct terrorist attacks. So, like, if there's more pressure on. Oh, 
Oh, uh, I, I am sure there is very good academic literature on that. Um, you know, I, I would, I would, when I look across the United States in particular and see a rise in uh, anti-Semitic terrorist attacks, when I see a rise in attacks against immigrant populations or um, the targeting of, um, of black Americans and African Americans, very deliberately sort of um, inspired by this racially and ethnically motivated violent extremism that believes in the superiority of the white race. It, it's very clear that we are in kind of a, a cycle of violence that targets those populations um, uh, based on sort of a transnational belief that um, we're dealing with in this country and that we see have maybe more devastating impacts in this country than in other parts of the world just because of the availability of weapons and, and the kinds of um, the kinds of, uh, of attacks that can occur. And so that, that's not the academic literature ver version of the answer to your question, but I am absolutely concerned about how minority populations, LGBTQI populations, um, among them, you know, uh, are, are under threat from, um, from individuals who would mobilize to violence for these very sort of, you know, um, you know these beliefs that, that um, I, I think are just really horrific. One thing, if I could say on that and get your response to, is that I, I led a study, a, a year-long study with some grad students on domestic terrorism. and. We, one of the key questions we began with was what lessons have we learned in international terrorism that we could apply to domestic? And we quickly kind of dropped that question and decided it was the wrong question because it really doesn't transfer. I mean, there are, yeah. obviously there are some things we've learned, but it the, doesn't. It doesn't. I mean, yeah. if, if, if you have a linkage between two people interested in a certain cause and, and it's overseas, if you're NSA or CIA, it's game on in terms of collection, whereas if it's here, it, that's legal speech, and there's nothing that's, there that the Bureau can go after without. So there's a, um, a helping on domestic terrorism from the standpoint of the IC. First of all, they're not really being asked to help that much. It's, mm -hmm. as you said, DHS yeah. and FBI. That's something that I think you said earlier today that Congress. So how do we, how do we keep that line where we work this problem hard but, but maintain the civil yeah. liberties and the, and the trust of the American people that we're maintaining the civil liberty? Well, well first of all, um, there, we are not policing ideology, right? Um, we are very concerned in the counterterrorism community. DHS and FBI are very concerned when a crime is committed, when violence is planned, when a threat presents itself. The ideology that motivates that um, is something we need to understand, something we need to sort of, you know, to, to be able to get ahead of the violent actors, understand what might be motivating any individual. But, you know, as much as I describe these horrific beliefs as horrific in my view, there's nothing illegal about them. What's illegal is a decision to conduct a terrorist attack, you know, um, against innocent civilians. You know, it's, it's interesting, we see we see you know, racially, ethnically motivated violent extremism. We also see uh, Al-Qaeda or ISIS-inspired extremism. We, we see that sometimes in the same individual uh, you know, mobilizing to violence. And, and so you know, really the, the challenge, and it's particularly hard when you're talking about lone actors, the challenge of getting ahead of the violent actor, that's, that's the terrorism yeah. challenge. That's it's, right. not, it's, it's not a challenge of policing beliefs. In fact, we cannot do that. We should not do that. We do not want to do that, um, given the, the just incredible importance to freedom of speech and, um, and, and to having sort of this, this milieu in the United States that allows all airings of opinions um, as, as legal and important to protect. And so, um, you know, DHS and, and FBI, I, I think, do a really good job of focusing on violent actors, on criminal behavior, on acts of violence that they are trying to prevent. Uh, and, uh, and we in the intelligence community, as we think about it from the transnational dynamic, as we think about it from uh, the global landscape perspective, we've, we've got to do the same thing. Right. Great. Back there. 
Thanks for thank you for coming. What what do you um, what's your view? Uh, what do you see in terms of increasing terrorist activity uh, in Israel uh, surrounding Israel? Um, and how does that uh, inspire your reaction, uh, response from the United States? Yeah. Um I mean, I, I am concerned about spiraling violence in that, that we're seeing in Israel and the Palestinian territories. You know, at, from my NCTC perch, I'm particularly concerned about um, how much of that violence is connected to, to terrorist groups that um, we're concerned about, whether that's Palestinian Islamic Jihad, whether that's Hamas, whether that's Lebanese Hezbollah, whether that's Iranian-supported elements, whether it's ISIS, whether it's Palestinians who have grievances that um, that uh, that that then inspire them to go conduct violence, and I think you're seeing sort of a mix of all of that happening in Israel with really serious geopolitical consequences for you know whether we're in a third intifada, for whether the conflict it can be one managed and de-escalated, and then two whether it becomes internationalized in a way that makes it much more persistent and challenging to deal with. And so, um, you know, for us, we care quite a bit, not only because of sort of all of these dynamics that I mentioned, but because the, the U.S. citizens who could be caught up in violence as a result of, of the escalatory um, violence that we're seeing there. And, and it's just something that we're monitoring as a top intelligence target going forward and trying to really think through the implications as we continue to focus, again, on this landscape I've already described as diverse that only gets more complicated with the introduction or reintroduction of a major conflict in, in Israel and the Palestinian territories. Young man right here. I was just wondering, uh, with the advancement of Iran towards a nuclear weapon, what is the concern that Iran either gives a weapon directly or weapons material to a terrorist group like Hamas and Hezbollah? Hmm. Um, I mean, any kind of proliferation of nuclear capability, whether to a new state actor or uh, you know the possibility that gets into the hands of uh, of terrorists, is always going to be a concern. Uh, that is not the dominant theme of my concerns right now with Iran and its use of proxy forces. I, I don't think they need to transfer a nuclear weapon to, to those uh, organizations to present a real strategic threat. And in fact, there's a lot of reasons why if Iran were to acquire a nuclear capability, they would certainly protect it from exactly that kind of thing. Um, but irrespective of, uh, of their nuclear ambition, irrespective of any kind of attempts to sort of forestall their, uh, that capability, it's very clear that they're continuing to invest in um, groups, individuals, and their own Iranian state agents with an asymmetric capability that you're not sort of dealing with nuclear deterrence theory on, but you're dealing with sort of gray zone conflict. And, and their use of these asymmetric, indiv these individuals and in asymmetric attacks against, um, against any number of adversaries. And so that has been a persistent theme with Iran and Iranian state sponsorship of terrorism. And it's particularly relevant in the ways we see that today manifesting in a threat to civilians overseas and here in the homeland. Dr. Greitens. Thank you. Sheena chestnut Greitens. I'm a professor at the LBJ School and a fellow with the uh, Clements and Strauss Centers. I had two questions. Um, I'll keep them very short. One is about how AI and machine learning have changed the analytic process for yeah. counterterrorism, um, if at all. And I wondered if you could... Not as much as I'd like, but go on. <laughs> okay, so that's question number one. Um, second question has to do with um, China's efforts to legitimate what it has done in Xinjiang in the past couple of years and the escalation of collective repression against the, the Uyghur um, Muslim and ethnic minority there um, as counterterrorism policy. Mm -hmm. And that's had global effects if you look at attempts to sort of introduce that discourse and line up diplomatic allies at the UN and in other international contexts. Um, 
So the question is less about sort of China's actions specifically and asking you to, to, to evaluate those and more, how has that changed the international organizational environment or the various sort of diplomatic ways that the United States tries to partner in counterterrorism if China has this global effort to legitimize its own framework for, for counterterrorism problems? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I just very briefly on your second question, I think it, it's, a, it's a significantly complicating factor. That means that you can't really have a strategic dialogue with your Chinese counterparts <coughs> on, the, uh, on counterterrorism cooperation that, that is needed. Um, because it is sort of um, poisoned or exploited to kind of deal with this, uh, this, this politicization of a significant part of their population that, um, that we as the United States government, as a matter of policy, as a matter of threat analysis, just don't agree with. And so, you know, when you see um, attacks in downtown Kabul against Chinese workers or, or a hotel where Chinese businessmen stay, you know, that should be an area that we can talk to the Chinese government about, understand our different views of what's happening in Afghanistan and the, the threat it presents to sort of the international presence there. But, but we really can't mature that conversation because it um, is stuck in sort of a very surface level uh, counterterrorism conversation that, that is stymied by exactly <coughs> that challenge that you raised. Excuse me. Um, in terms of AI, ML, um, big data analysis, uh, any number of um, kind of uh, advanced analytic techniques that we would want to apply to what I think is a very rich field of um, counterterrorism information. When I think about uh, the, the data points that we have had to collect over the 20 years of our campaign uh, against, uh, against terrorist groups, and the, the information that, much of it inherently unclassified, uh, that, um, that provides us to not just kind of understand the threat environment broadly speaking, but to be able to be data informed about that threat environment and what our analytic, what, which of our analytic judgments are actually underpinned by the, the, the data that we have. And I think that we are still in the intelligence community broadly and in the CT analytic community generally, we're only now thinking of <coughs> and, and, and practicing an integration of advanced data analytic techniques as against our traditional intelligence analytic work. And it's something that, you know, one, you've got to build sophisticated systems to be able to leverage the best AI ML techniques against. Um, I, I, I am, you know, as somebody who left the government for the private sector and came back to the government, I'm even more appalled by, you know, the, the, the sophistication of the systems that we use across the United States government and how slow we are in terms of software development, incorporating that into the best and most important uses for the intelligence community. So, so this is a big priority for us to modernize, both at the National Counterterrorism Center in the intelligence community more broadly, but I, I think we have a long way to go, quite frankly. And so um, some of that is like on the basic boring stuff of data maintenance, data cleanliness, data um, characterization, and, and then applying these most important advanced techniques of being able to cull through that data, to discover threats, so that you're not in a position where you have all the data points, you just didn't connect them to be able to stay ahead of, uh, of a real challenge. And so we're, we're working through that in the National Counterterrorism Center. We think it's an important part of our role as a service to the United States government about providing the right kind of data analysis about what the, the threat environment is telling us. Um, and and it's, it's something that um, we've really redoubled our efforts on over the last several years. Peyton. Peyton Elman. Hi, Director Abizade. Um, I was wondering if you could speak about, in the age of social, social media and it being used as such a recruitment platform um, among many terrorist groups, the, what's your assessment on the effectiveness of relying on the companies <coughs> to kind of filter a lot of the different chat rooms and ideology that's being spread, mm. and if that's a sustainable way moving forward 
to continue to kind of combat the social media yeah. recruitment um, scene. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, for me, I think this comes down to a really important mission of information sharing, right? Um, we spend a lot of time understanding how terrorist adversaries are using social media, are using kind of propaganda platforms, are using interconnectivity to, as you say, recruit, to uh, inspire, to enable uh, adherence to, to conduct attacks globally. And, um, and those companies that understand their, um, the, their, the way in which their platforms are being manipulated by bad actors, by terrorist groups, have an interest in making sure that, um, that, they, are, that they are dealing with that content, that they are um, depriving them of that resource to continue to spread the, the wrong kinds of threat across a, a, a transnational community. And so for us at the National Counterterrorism Center, we think it's really important to be able to engage with companies about what we understand the threat environment looks like, the way in which different platforms are being utilized, um, how that is contributing to the spread of capability and, uh, and, and attacks uh, across the globe, and then kind of Use, letting companies inform their policies by what we're able to tell them about adversarial behavior. But it's got to be a company's decision to kind of set their own policies, to leverage the information that they have been provided, whether by us or their own systems, uh, and, and to make decisions based on that. And I think that we've seen over the course of many years in a long dialogue across the national security community and, and, and tech platforms, a maturing of their policies, their ability to ingest new information, and their ability to um, understand what's traversing their platform and when that really violates their terms of service or, or, or other things. And I think that that's, that's been an important and useful evolution. But, but what we see is a terrorist adversary that is constantly finding new ways around protections or around changes that happen uh, on you know, platforms across the globe. And so for us, it's going to always be an intelligence challenge to understand how a terrorist group is mediating across these social media platforms or content sharing platforms or other forms of communication so that we can both understand their plans, intentions, and capabilities, and then two, help those companies whose infrastructure is being exploited understand um, just what threat is being presented and then, and then you know, adjust their policies to deal with it if it's in their interest to do so. Unfortunately, I think that's gonna have to be our last question. Okay. Um, I wanted I to- I survived. You survived. <laughs> you, Those you, were hard. You, you actually did well. Um, I wanna, you don't know, but beyond this, um, this event, um, Director Abizade has met with students last night over dinner, uh, appeared in a large undergraduate class I have, met with another group of us at the Clement Center. So you've been incredibly generous with your time. I've loved and it. And very frank, and we, and we greatly appreciate you coming to us. So well, thank you very much. Did you want to say anything else?